morning, everyone, and welcome to the November Student Office Hour for Maryland History Day. My name is Leah Atnett, and it's my job to visit schools all over Maryland and make sure that students have all the resources that you need to make an awesome History Day project. So you might recognize me if I've come to your classroom this year, but I am here to help if you guys have questions, I am here to answer them. Um, so the purpose of these office hours is to give you guys some extra tips um, for wherever you are in the project, and also to give you an opportunity to ask me your questions directly and to hear the answers live. Um, this is our third office hour of the school year. If you are curious about what we talked about at the last two, if you weren't able to make it, our first office hour in September was an introduction to what History Day is and how to get started, how to pick a topic. Our office hour last month in October was, um, was just the beginnings of doing research, so just scratching the surface. And our topic for this month is about conducting research, but it's really about digging a little bit deeper. So now you've had the intro, how are you gonna find those primary sources? What are you gonna do with them when you find them? Um, so we invite you to ask your questions and you can ask your questions no matter where you are in the process. If you are still not to this point, even if you are still picking out a topic, that's just fine. We still wanna hear your questions. And you can find that um, by going to the description under this video, and you'll find a link to a Google form. So click on that link. And in the form, you can uh, add your name if you'd like a shout out. Tell us what county you're from, if you wouldn't mind, so we, can, so we know who we're reaching. And then you'll have a place to ask your question and even tell us your topic if you have a topic and you'd like to to give us a little extra context to help answer your question. Uh, and then we'll answer it live. So the, the format for these office hours is we'll go back and forth. I'll give you guys a couple of tips and then we'll take questions from you all and we'll go back and forth a few times. Um, we expect that this will last just about in, between 45 minutes and an hour. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. We'll start out with some tips from me and then we'll go to you guys. Okay, so my first tip is about where to find primary sources. And my tip for you is to figure out which databases and libraries will be most useful for you. So that might take a little bit of Googling, a little bit of sleuthing to figure out what different databases specialize in. So I've got some examples for you. So one that we always like to tell students about is the National Archives. That is a wonderful source of lots and lots of primary sources. But the thing is, the only, the documents that they create are only those that are created by the US government. That's what you will find at the National Archives. So if you're doing a world history topic, you probably won't have too much luck there unless it's something about the, um, the foreign relations between the US and that international place. Um, if you are doing a topic in US history where the sources you're looking for will not originate with the US government, also probably won't be the best place to look. Um, but for anything that touches on the US government in any way, um, this is a good place to start. And I recommend to students, if you do wanna look into the National Archives, the site that is most useful that's connected to them is called Docs Teach. And I'm going to pop into a web browser right now uh, to show you what Docs Teach looks like. So it's docsteach.org. And this is what the site will look like. So you'll have to scroll down a little bit to get to the place where you can click on explore this orange button, explore primary source documents. And then here you can type in your topic, I'm gonna pick Panama Canal, we'll try that one out and click search now. 
and the page refreshed, but you'll have to scroll down to see what it came up with. And there are 61 documents that were found. If you search the whole National Archives website, you might come up with hundreds or even thousands of documents. And that's gonna be a lot to wade through. So with DocsTeach, instead of being hundreds or thousands, they pick the few dozen that are most relevant to your topic, that are absolutely connected, not these things that are just connected tangentially. Okay, so taking a look, we've got a picture from the Panama Canal Zone in the 50s, um, a letter from John Wayne to President Carter about the Panama Canal. So this is all directly relevant. These are all directly relevant sources if I'm doing a project about the Panama Canal. So I love DocsTeach and I'm gonna click through on one of them. So I'll click through on this letter. And once I'm on that site, I can find more information. So there's a little summary of what it's about. We have full citation information. Um, so you can actually just copy and paste the citation to put onto your bibliography. So that is very useful. And some uh, important documents will have transcripts there too, especially the handwritten ones. Um, any treaties that you find on here, you can usually find transcripts in HTML form. So it's a little bit easier to work with than these uh, scans and photos of documents. Okay, so that's my first recommendation. All right, I'm going back to the PowerPoint now. Okay, so my next recommendation is the Library of Congress. And what are they known for? Well, again, it's gonna be mostly US history with some exceptions. They do have some collections of world history documents. And the great majority of the documents they have are from between the 1860s and the 1960s. You will, of course, find some stuff from before the 1860s. Um, what you'll find after the 1960s is really not so much. So that was their main period of when they were collecting um, documents and materials to put in the Library of Congress. And if you've never heard of the Library of Congress, the Library of Congress is like the library of the whole United States. You know, we've all got our local public libraries. This is the library of the whole United States. So they collect everything that they can um, to, to have in their library. So including documents, photographs, books, pamphlets, posters, even objects, artifacts. And there's lots and lots of stuff that they make available on their website. The next one I want to share with you is Chronicling America, and this is run by the Library of Congress, and it is all newspapers, historical newspapers. So if you think newspapers will help out with your topic, this is a good place to look. But again, we have a time constraint here, and this time it's a, it's a firm constraint. So you won't find anything before 1777 and you won't find anything after 1962 on this site. So if you wanted to look into other newspapers, you would have to find another more recent database. But this is an excellent place if your topic is within uh, those two years. Next, I've got World Digital Library. And this is actually a project of the Library of Congress as well. Um, this is a great source if you are doing a world history topic, but most of their sources are from before the 20th century. So that's something to keep in mind if you are using this collection. Another collection that I like to recommend is called Fordham Sourcebooks. It is run by Fordham University. So we know that universities are one of the institutions that we can always trust. They're the ones who are producing knowledge. Um, they are the ones doing the research and making it available to everybody. And I like Fordham source books because not only does it have some modern history topics, but it's one of the rare collections that also includes ancient medieval um, documents and global documents from all over the world and all throughout history. 
So often I'll have students asking me, where can I find primary sources on ancient history? Well, this is one of the places that I recommend. And they are all text-based sources. So if you're looking for images, you'll wanna look somewhere else like World Digital Library. Um, but as we know, texts are really important for getting some of the information that we need to tell our story. Okay, um, next I recommend looking at presidential libraries. If you are doing a topic that relates to the federal government, that relates to um, executive orders or presidential decisions, that is a good place to look. Um, each president has his own uh, library of documents and primary sources and photographs related to his presidency. So you can find um, each has their own website. You can also look at government agencies like the National Park Service. They often have a lot of good secondary source information about um, you know, the, how, the work that they've done throughout the years for the National Park Service. You can find secondary source information about lots of different historical sites. So, um, so those are good resources. And then you can also look at the websites of different museums that specialize in various topics. Um, depending on what your topic is, you might find a museum that can be very helpful to you. And I'm gonna show you another um, place to look. So um, back in my web browser, I'm actually going to the NHD website, nhd.org, is they have a really fantastic list of websites that you can look at. I'm going to four students and how to. And from there, I am clicking on conducting research. I hope I went to the right place. No, I'm clicking on student resources. Okay, there we go. Student resources page and then helpful research links. And on this page, you will find a really, really big list of different um, museums, archives, organizations that focus in on really specific topics. And you might find that they connect to your topic in really useful ways. So um, just taking a look here, I see um, a center for the study of invention and innovation. That might be really useful for those of you doing topics in science this year about um, forging new uh, frontiers in the sciences and technology. Um, I see a site about the history of NASA. Um, lots and lots of good stuff. National Park Service, which I just mentioned. National Women's History Museum. And what's nice is since this is all right on a web page, I can search for things using Control F. So I'm doing Control F. And let's say I'm studying um, Asian history. I'm going to type in Asia. And we've got the Digital South Asia Library. That might be useful. And I've got the Southeast Asian Images and Text Projects. So again, um, this is a really good way to find things on a web page using that control F find feature. Um, let's say I am looking at, maybe I'm looking specifically at China. Okay, good. We've got one hit for China and it's posters from the former Soviet Union, Cuba and China. That sounds really interesting actually. Okay, so this is just one example for you of a great place to find different websites and databases that can help out with your, um, with your research. Okay, so going back. So all of these are great if you have um, a sort of older topic. Um, if you have a, um, a more modern topic, you might find yourself looking at, um, you might find yourself looking at newspapers, but again, those more recent newspaper archives, um, not chronicling America, or you might be able to find uh, video clips of interviews if your topic is recent enough. So those are good places to start um, if, you're, if you're looking after the 1960s and you're not gonna find much in the Library of Congress or chronicling America.
Okay, um, so I'm gonna pause there and see if you guys have any questions. All right, and it looks like we have a question from Madison. Hi, Madison. Um, and she would like to know some good websites to find information on religions. Okay, excellent. Um, well, I'm gonna go back to my web browser. And actually on this page that I just shared with you from NHD, um, I happen to see one on, um, on Jewish history right here at the top. So the American Jewish Historical Society, open that in a new page, take a look. And these, um, these sites that NHD suggests, they could have primary sources, they could have secondary sources, a combination. So it looks like there's a research catalog and a museum collection that you can access on this site. Um, let's see, what else we, can we do? I also know that there is a Jewish Museum of Maryland that's located in Baltimore. Um, they will have their own site and they likely have some of their own collections or information uh, on their website as well. Um, but we can also search on one of our websites to, um, to see what comes up. So why don't we do that? Um, I'm gonna open up Let's see, we'll try on Docs Teach. So back to Docs Teach, which I just shared with you guys. And I'm gonna see if I can find any African Methodist Episcopal churches um, that they've talked about in Docs Teach that they've put up on this website. So um, I'm gonna start by doing AME Church, which is short for African Methodist Episcopal. And I've got actually two hits here. Oh, that's great. I wasn't sure if I would find anything, but it looks like I've got one from 1866, a memorial from an African Methodist Episcopal Church of Atlanta. So that's very cool. And it looks like it's handwritten. I'm just gonna take a quick look. And it's a few pages long and it looks like we've got a transcript. So we are super lucky. We have it all in, um, in HTML form, so we don't have to worry about decoding that handwriting. So that is very, very cool. But if you wanna take a look, it's also a good way to practice reading old handwriting. Um, so you can search for different religious groups that you're interested in on this site, on the Library of Congress site. Um, you can, I know that, uh, Baltimore has an interfaith organization that might have some resources on it. Um, so I think that those are good places to start. Yeah, I really like this list. I'm gonna, let me just see if anything else comes up. Maybe we can find something on Islam here. No, unfortunately. Okay. Um, well, I've got a few more tips later on that might help out with that question too some different ways to search. Okay. Also, okay, next we've got a question from Evan. Hi, Evan. Um, he's researching Cory Aquino and the Filipino People's Power Revolution. He asks, is Frontier also considered a pioneer? I want to highlight Cory as the Frontier who helped the Filipinos stop the, the leadership of a dictator? That's a really good question. And I would say, yes, absolutely. So the way that I have been explaining frontiers to people, well, we all know that frontiers can look a lot of different ways. So we're all probably familiar with the, the geographical interpretation of what a frontier is, sort of um, like coming to a new place, um, exploring a new area, um, things like this, crossing over borders, um, the people who live in the borderlands. So that's the geographical idea. Um, but when we're thinking about people and how people can help us uh, push past frontiers and um, 
and make new advancements. You know, that's that's what we're thinking of when we're thinking of those um, scientific frontiers or those social frontiers like this one that you're talking about. It's about the people who are pushing for progress in their society. It's about the people who are giving others a new outlook for what the future can look like. And it sounds like that's exactly what Corey Aquino was doing in the Philippines, um, giving people a new outlook for what Um, the society in the Philippines could look like, what the government could look like. Um, So yeah, absolutely. I would say that Aquino was a pioneer and that he pushed for new social and political frontiers in the Philippines. Absolutely. That's a great topic. I don't know too much about it, but the way you describe it um, sounds absolutely like a frontier. Okay. All right, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to go back to my tips, but I think we've got some new questions that are going to come in um, in the next in the next little break. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So next, I have some search tips for you guys, and this one is really fun. Um, so my first um, my first idea for you is to combine search terms. So if you're searching on Google, if you're searching on a website like the Library of Congress, and you find that you're just searching the same term over and over again, um, like Panama Canal, I searched that before, but that's just one example. Um, You might try combining it with other key terms or key words that you have that have been coming up in your research. And that might help you get some narrower results if you're just seeing the same results over and over again. So I'm gonna go, um, well, first of all, I'll show you how to do that. So to do that, you can use some Boolean search terms like and, or, and not. And quotes are also gonna be a useful tool for you. So let me go back into my web browser to show you how to use some of these Boolean search terms. Okay, so um, first of all, we will try, um, we'll try Panama Canal, but we wanna combine it with another term that is gonna help us get narrower. And notice how I'm putting it in quotes. I'm putting it in quotes to keep those two words together um, so that we don't come up with a document that has Panama over here and Canal over here and nothing about the actual Panama Canal that we wanna learn about. So I've got it in quotes. I'm gonna put and in capital letters. And let's say I wanna figure out um, how uh, President Roosevelt was involved in the Panama Canal. What did he do specifically? Um, I know that he was president at the time. I know he had something to do with the the construction of the Panama Canal or the plans, but I wanna find some, some documents, some sources that tell me exactly how they were connected. So I'm gonna say Panama Canal and Roosevelt. Okay, so our first hit is from the Constitution Center. The Constitution Center is a museum and research center and it is a place that I know I can trust. Um, If you're not sure, you can always go to the site, go to the about page, see what what that uh, organization is about, see if you think you can trust them. Um, see if they are doing good educational work um, or if they are supporting a political position, things like this. Um, But this looks like it's going to have some good secondary source information from a source that I know is reliable. So that's one thing we can look at. Um, Here's one from history.state.gov. Again, we know that .gov um, websites are generally um, reliable because the government gets real historians to do their work for you. This is from the Office of the Historian. So it looks like there's gonna be some good secondary source info in here. PBS.org is an educational organization. So that can be a good place to look. Okay, so and notice how it's giving me results that only have to do with specifically how Roosevelt is connected to the Panama Canal. 
So that's going to be a really useful way to see both of those terms coming up together. Okay, um, let's do another example. So um, let's say I want to learn more about um, girls who are playing baseball throughout history. So I'm going to search baseball and girls. Okay. Well, it looks like it's giving me some modern day stuff. I might have to um, add in the word history here. History of baseball and girls. All right, excellent. And let's say, I was gonna use that as my next example. Let's say we wanna add in women, maybe not just girl. Um, we wanna say either girls or women. So I'm putting some parentheses and I'm gonna say girls or women, sort of like a math problem. So you do the parentheses first. And there we go. So we've got ones that say women, ones that say girls, but they are all going to be useful to me because I don't mind whether it's adults or children. I just wanna know about girls or women in baseball. Okay, so that's another example. Um, let's see. Okay, I think that's all I'll show for now of that. Um, ooh, it looks like I've got some topics in here that I might be able to search. So um, I've got one, Ashley is doing um, the North American Gold Rush. Very cool, so let's try that. So I'm gonna search Gold Rush and look, I'm putting it in quotes. And um, let's say I wanna look at a very specific location. So I'm going to pick um, Klondike, which is in Alaska. So let's see what comes up with Klondike. Oh, first hit, nationalparkservice.gov. I like that. That looks like it's gonna be a legit secondary source for me. And it might take me to some good primary sources as well. All right, very cool. Lots of good stuff here. Some stuff that we might not necessarily include on our final project like Wikipedia, History.com is sort of, I don't love uh, .com sources for this because I, I know that I can find so much other good stuff from .edu sites and the like. Oh, here's one at washington.edu. That'll be good. All right, lots of excellent stuff here. Um, let me see, early LGBTQ marriages. Ooh, okay, so this is a good one. So for this, um, I can use or again. So I'm going to say marriage and then put parentheses and say gay or L G B T or L G B T Q. Just cover all our bases because I'm not sure which one they're going to use. Um, and that's from EMEA. So take a look at that. EMEA, we've got something from um, EPA, something from the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, we, we also have some news. So this might be you know, a way to find um, events to connect it to the modern day, since you all will be connecting your topic in some way to the modern day. All right, lots of good stuff in here, but I'm gonna give you some other ways to narrow it down too. Okay. So going back to um, my PowerPoint, I've got another really cool tip. Um, oh, use filters. So this is um, when you are on a site like the Library of Congress, um, you can always use filters to narrow down what you're looking at. So I'm going to loc.gov, the Library of Congress. Um, I see that Parker is doing the Oregon Trail. So let's try that one. And ooh, take a look at that, more than 83,000 hits. That's way too many to look through. And it looks like most of them are uh, in the newspaper. And I'm actually gonna go back and put quotes around it because maybe I'm getting Oregon on one side of the page and trail on the other side. So let's see, oh, and that helped a lot actually. That cut it down to 1,800. And let's say I just wanna find images. So let's see. If I go down to photos, prints, and drawings, they're only 253. So that's going to, again, narrow my search down, make it a lot easier to go through things. And from there, I want to look at a specific time period. So I'm going to scroll down, C 
see if I can find the time. Maybe I passed it. Oh, here we go. So um, I want to look at um, what people were saying about the Oregon Trail in the 20th century. It's like there's not a whole lot, but there is a, a small collection in the 40s. So let's see what that's about. All right, and it looks like we've got a drawing from a, from a book maybe, um, and we have some images. So that's really interesting. So somebody went back to the, the Oregon Trail um, location and took some pictures many years later. I'd be really interested to find out more about the photographer and why he decided to do that. Okay, so that's just an example of how you can narrow things down with filters. And this last um, tip that I have for you is really a lot of fun. Um, so this one, and this is something you can teach your teachers because some of them don't know this either. But if you're searching in Google and you're trying to find reliable sites in Google, you know, we took a look and, and we sort of got a mixed bag when we were um, searching for things just now. Um, but if you want to make sure that you are getting sites that we trust like .edu sites or .gov sites, you can use this one cool trick. Um, so I'm gonna head back over to my web browser to show you how to use these. Okay, so opening up a new, um, new search. And um, so let's say I'm doing my um, project on the history of Barbie dolls. And this is actually a topic that we saw a couple years ago. Some students made a really awesome website about um, Barbie dolls and gender expectations. So it was serious stuff and you wouldn't know it um, with the topic being Barbies. So I'm gonna search Barbie dolls and, um, and let's see. So if I just search Barbie dolls, I know it's gonna happen. I'm gonna get a whole bunch of websites trying to sell me Barbie dolls. So I'm gonna try not to get that. Um, so one trick that I like to put out there is to exclude all .com sites. Because as I mentioned, .com means it's a commercial site. And we don't always know what their intentions are for commercial sites. So the way to exclude a site is to put a hyphen, like a minus sign, basically, the word site, a colon, and then .com. No space, just hyphen, site, colon, .com. So this is going to rule out all of those .com sites that are trying to sell me things. I've still got Wikipedia. Well, we'll look at that. So now I've got Canadian sites trying to sell me things and British sites trying to sell me things. So it looks like that's not gonna work for us. So instead, what I'm gonna do is look for Barbie dolls only on .edu sites. So instead of saying minus sign, site.com, I'm going to get rid of the hyphen and say site colon edu. So this trick is going to bring me up only edu sites. So take a look at that. We've got here, we've got a university. We've got the smithsonian.edu, more smithsonian. So this is going to give us more about the history of Barbies. And if we really wanted to make sure it was history, we could add the word history in here. But I just wanted to show you guys um, the differences between excluding .coms and searching only for .edu's. So this could be a great site for me. Looks like we will have um, some primary source images of some artifacts, some old Barbie dolls. So this could be very cool to use in my project. Okay. Um, so I've shown you two now. So I've showed you um, looking for without.com or yeah, without.com, with.edu. We'll do another search. So I'll search for um, Dolores Huerta. And again, I'm going to search. I don't want .com. So I'm going to search the sign site colon .com. And this time it was good that we searched uh, no.com and so .edu because um, there's a her foundation, which is a .org. And so it might be useful to look at the foundation and look at that as a legacy of the work that she's done. 
And that wouldn't have come up if we had just looked at edu. Um, scrolling down a little bit more, notice how there are no .coms here. It's all .org, .edu, .gov. And I'm going to take a look at this one. This one is from Iowa State University. And let's see what they have on here. They've got a short um, biography, which is a secondary source. And if I scroll down, actually got some of her speeches. And a couple of them are from the 1960s, which might be the time period you're studying if you're doing a project on Dolores Huerta. Um, so there are some excellent primary sources that I can use. OK. Um, We'll try another one. Let's say we're looking at um, the Silk Road. I'm again gonna put it in quotes so that we keep those words together. Silk Road site colon dot edu. Look for those dot edu sites. Got Fordham University again. Um, I'm gonna click through on this one. It's often really hard to find primary sources about old time periods like the Silk Road. But um, for this one, there are, there's actually a bunch of historical texts here. So take a look at this. Some really awesome historical texts. This is all from the, um, the editor who put them together. But these are the real words from people from hundreds and thousands of years ago. And again, since it's an HTML format, we can use Control F to find some key terms that we might be interested in. Like, I wanna find out um, what countries were trading gold on the Silk Road and look at all those hits that we have, 61 hits for the word gold. Okay, um, so going back to, I had a question actually about um, changing terms, like um, how terms change over, over the years, the words that we use to describe things. And I think this, um, this search about um, LGBTQ marriages is a good way to show how terms can change. Um, because, you know, today the term LGBTQ plus is really common or other variations of that LGBTQIAA plus um, or others like that. Um, but of course, that's a newer term that wasn't used um, even 20 years ago, and definitely not more than that. Um, so earlier than that, you know, the word gay has been around for a long time. So that's one that might come up in older sources, but it still really wasn't used so much if you were looking at really old um, instances of it. Um, you might look at the term homosexual, which, um, you know, was used until recently. Um, it's not used so much within the LGBTQ community now because, um, you know, it was originally used as a, as a medical diagnosis, which is not such a pleasant part of that history. Um, but you might look at some of the early LGBTQ marriages that you find, um, that you learn about, and see what terms were used um, when uh, newspapers were referring to those couples or um, in the official documents, the marriage documents about those couples to give you an idea of what terms people were using in the years that you are studying. So it might be that, you know, gay and lesbian were being used or maybe not. So um, yeah, look, look at the sources, um, be prepared to see some different terms that you might not have expected. Okay, um, so I think, at this point, I'm gonna open it up and see if there are any more questions. Actually, so I've shared some tips that I really like to, <laughs> to demo, but I'll open it up at this point um, and see if you guys have any other questions. Okay, awesome. So Shiloh is working on a project about Mae Jemison, who's the first Black woman to fly to the moon. And they ask, would Black history count as a frontier? And if so, why? Um, yeah, absolutely. But it's up to you to pick out those moments that really show people, um, you know, creating a new frontier, or passing through a new frontier. 
And Mae Jemison is an excellent example of that for a couple different reasons. Um, first of all, because you're talking about going to space, which already is a new frontier for everybody, um, because it's a it's a space that we know so little about. It's a um, it's a space that we are still discovering, that we are still learning about. Um, and the nickname for space is the final frontier. So automatically we have that connection between space and frontiers. But then when you've got Mae Jemison as a black woman, um, you know, anytime you are the first to do something, um, the first of your community, um, the first in the world, um, that's always a, a frontier that's being broken through. And for her, it was the frontier of paving the way for other Black women, um, other people of color um, in uh, space travel, in, um, in, uh, in the sciences in general, in astronomy, in all of these scientific fields. Um, and that is absolutely a frontier. And if you're looking at other aspects of, of Black history, there are all sorts of different ways that you can find um, people uh, representing frontiers for whatever they were doing. So whether it was people um, fighting for rights through the civil rights movement, um, and you'd wanna look at a specific instance, a specific person, a specific event, um, that's pushing for social progress, that's um, you know, new social frontiers, Again, like I, like I mentioned, giving people a new outlook for what the future can look like. So Mae Jemison created this future where Black girls could say, um, I want to be an astronaut. I want to go to space. Um, and yeah, there are many others who did the same in their fields. All right. Any other questions? Feel like we've got tons to talk about today. <laughs> All right. So Camden asks, what are some old cases about women's suffrage? Well, you know, it's been a long time since I studied women's suffrage. I'll admit it to you guys. Um, so what I'll recommend that you do is use some of those tools that I just shared with you to search for women's suffrage and see what comes up. So you can search women's suffrage. Um, and I'm going to use that edu because that is my favorite um, type of site to search. And, um, and look at this. We've got a U.S. suffrage movement timeline. So that will definitely give us some of the main events and women's suffrage. I know that um, the Seneca Falls Convention was a really important milestone in the women's rights, um, in women's rights history, in women's suffrage history. Um, that was the, the first time that lots of women came together to, um, to talk about the need for women to vote. And you can also learn the names of a lot of important suffragists on this timeline. So this is a good place to start. Um, look through here, um, find some of those events that you are interested in that really jump out at you. Maybe you decide to look at something like the National American Women's Suffrage Association and um, something important that they participated in. And then from there, you can search for that term on another site. Search it on the Library of Congress, see what comes up. All right, so that's the advice that I'll give you. Okay, any other questions? All right, and Mia had a similar question about LGBTQ rights. Maybe, um, let's see. All right, so you, Amia, you can use the same um, process that I just showed to Camden um, about searching, maybe you can search LGBTQ rights timeline 
and then narrow it down to that edu site so you know you're getting something reliable and do the same thing just see what names are coming up important names see what um, important events are coming up i know you'll find things like the stonewall riots um, you'll find um, which was you know one of the first big protests um, against uh, police intervention into um, LGBTQ people's lives. Um, and there are other you know, events like that throughout history where um, LGBTQ people fought for their rights. So yeah, do a search like I just showed you and that'll lead you to some great results. All right, any other questions for now? Got one more slide to share. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna um, share my last section of tips. So my last tip for you is to take effective notes throughout your whole research process. And you won't regret it because um, if you don't take good notes, you'll, you'll forget why a source was important to you. You might forget you even looked at that source. So, um, so just make note of every source that you've looked at and why you found it important. And that's gonna help you create your annotated bibliography as well. So my tips for taking effective notes, first of all, is to skim and scan and read for gist, um, which means reading for the basic, uh, the, the basic information. So in other words, you don't need to necessarily read every single word of every single document you find. You would be reading so much, you wouldn't be able to do anything else. So instead, what you're going to do is, going down to my second bullet point, um, find the information that helps you answer your research question. And I talked about the research question in my last office hour. And the research question is the thing that's going to keep you focused, the thing that's going to keep you from reading every single document you find, and instead keep you focused on one aspect of that um, that event that you're interested in. So, um, so for example, actually I've got an example on here. So my research question here is was, and this is from last year, excuse me for having an old theme, um, but it says, was the Alaska purchase a success or a failure of diplomacy? And here, the point is that my topic is the Alaska purchase but I'm not just gonna write down every single thing that I can find about the Alaska Purchase because I'd be writing all day long. Instead, I'm gonna focus most of my energy toward answering this question because that's the story that I've decided I wanna tell. And I recommend that you guys do the same. So um, instead of saying, I'm gonna research LGBTQ marriage, um, find a question that you wanna answer about it. So um, what challenges did LGBTQ people face in their attempts to get marriage? That's something that you can write down. So um, who was trying to block them and why? That's an aspect that you can focus on. Um, and it'll keep you focused as you're doing your research so you don't get overwhelmed. Um, my next tip for taking effective notes is, um, is to say that you, you don't just have to paraphrase. I know um, it's tempting just to take what you've read and put it into your own words, but there are other types of notes that you can take as well. So you can write down direct quotes that you get that might be good evidence later on, get a really meaty quote that really says a lot and, and copy and paste it. Make sure you make note that you've copied and pasted it, that it's not your own words. Um, and use it as a direct quote as evidence in your project. Um, you can note down questions you have. If there's something you don't understand, if there's something that you think you might want to investigate further, make note of that. That's going to give you some direction, some where to go next. Um, make notes of your own analysis of a source. So not just what does the source say directly, but how does this source connect with the other things that you're reading? And then, of course, you can also have the paraphrased information that's going to be useful for telling your story. Okay, so I've got this example about the Alaska Purchase, and I've got a little excerpt 
about um, what the the treaty with Russia, the treaty between the U.S. and Russia, said about um, the Russian inhabitants of Alaska and also the Alaska natives who um, who lived there um, after Alaska was shifted to a U.S. territory. So. Um, on the next page, I show you guys what I decided to take notes on. Um, and I also wanted to show you this as a model of uh, how you might decide to take notes. So this shows a way that you can be organized. You can, this. I did this in a Google Doc. This is one document. And I can save this to a Google folder on my Google Drive. Um, keep everything together. Keep everything about your project in one place. And then I also like to label my notes. So um, each of the notes that I made is going to fit in with a different part of my project. So these two notes, they're going to be, they're going to work best in the context section of my project when I'm giving the background information. But these two notes are going to work better for showing the short-term impact of, um, of the Alaska Purchase. So I'm gonna label everything so I know why it was important to me and where I was going to put it in my project. Um, and notice how I also put a link to where that source is online so that I can easily go back to it when I need to. I recommend that you guys do the same, always bookmark or um, copy the links to the sources you're working with. I also wanted to point out that um, when I was taking these notes, I had an example, all four types of notes that I just told you guys about. So um, that's my example. And finally, um, I will open it up for another round of questions if we have any more. Okay, um, so I've got a question from Ashley and she asks, would including .gov also take me to reliable sources? The answer is yes. So .gov sources are reliable. Um, the government always uh, recruits real historians to write any secondary sources that they produce. And .gov websites may also have primary sources on them that you can use. So .gov are definitely a good place to look. Again, government agencies um, are good places if you are looking at um, the history of medicine, public health events. Um, you might look at, um, at a health-related government agency. Okay, let's see if there are any other questions in our Google form. All right, we got a question from Camden about the definition of suffrage. Um, and they ask is, are Muslim women, is Muslim women not being able to take off their hijab women's suffrage? So suffrage is actually just specifically about uh, the right to vote actually. Um, so when we talk about women's suffrage, um, it is about women's right to vote, um, which is something that um, they eventually achieved in 1920. Um, so if you wanted to talk about um, other forms of, um, you know, women's expression, you might, uh, you know, women's rights sort of covers all of those things. It covers women's right to vote and also women's rights to, um, to express themselves um, through religious garments or not. Um, so women's rights covers all that. But again, I, I do recommend getting specific. So what do you really want to focus on? Do you want to focus on voting or do you want to focus on religious garb? All right, because they're two very different things, even though they fall under the umbrella of women's rights. Okay, um, and Madison asks, asks, are there any websites or documents that I can use to compare different religions or uh, would I use the same ones you gave me? Um, ooh, that's a really good question. And I, I don't know of any um, websites specifically where you could compare religions on that site. I think in this case, it might just be up to you to find some sources about each religion that you're interested in 
and for you to do that analysis and do that comparison between them um, and pick just a few ways to compare them because um, it's, it's really hard to compare them on every single thing. Um, okay. And Parker asks, um, what is needed to make the project a success? Wow, that's a that's a big question because there are there are a lot of criteria that make an excellent project, and I recommend that you take a look at um, the rubrics. So I'll hop over to the NHD site. Um, so I'm going to nhd.org um, slash rubric or no nope, slash evals. Okay, and they've got all the evaluations here um, for the five different formats. So this is documentary, um, but for the first page of all of them, they have the same criteria. It's just on the second page when it gets into presentation type that they are different. So this page will be the same for all. And there are eight criteria under historical quality for what makes an excellent project. So I recommend that you take a look at these, um, having a good, clear thesis statement that you support with evidence, making a connection to the theme, um, doing wide research with many different types of sources, so not just images, but lots of text-based sources, um, documents, newspapers, whatever's available for your topic. Um, making sure you are making good use of primary sources, um, making sure that you are situating your topic in a historical context where the reader can understand the background of the time period and the place before you get into um, the event itself, making sure that you are looking at multiple perspectives or looking at a perspective of an event that is not usually considered, um, making sure that your work is historically accurate. And finally, showing the significance of your event in history. And we're gonna do that by, um, by showing the impacts that your topic had, both in the short term and in the long term. So all of these things are important uh, for making an excellent History Day project. You can find that at nhg.org slash evals, E-V-A-L-S, short for evaluations. Okay, thank you guys for the excellent questions tonight. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna, it is six o'clock. We went all the way through the whole hour. Um, if your friends couldn't make it, you can point them to this page so they can watch the recording because I think we covered a lot of great stuff. Thank you again for the excellent questions tonight. Um, join us for the next one. So our next office hour will be Thursday, December 15th, again at 5 p.m. Um, you can subscribe to the Maryland Humanities YouTube channel and then click the bell to get a notification for the next time we have one of these office hours. Um, and I think that's it for me. Thanks again for being here. It's been a pleasure answering your questions tonight um, and have a good evening.